and i'm very happy to be associated uh, with the tamil nadu state committee in the observations of the centenary of the foundation of the communist party in india this has been a century a glorious of glorious uh, struggles sacrifices and blacks of communists being martyred in the struggles for india's freedom and subsequently facing the worst form of repression continuing to face these form of repression the communists have battled battled on the basis of their, comm their commitment battled on the basis of their de dedication to transform india into an exploitation free society that is a socialist india since the foundation in 1920 17th of october since that foundation the communist party actively intervened to reach out to the indian people propagate the scientific creative science of marxism leninism and on the basis of the glorious victory of the russian revolution propagating the ideal of socialism as the ultimate objective went into directly contacting the indian people in a big way and at the same time it was intervening very very importantly significantly in the national ongoing national movement for india's freedom the communist party moved a resolution asking for complete independence from the british rule this was in 1921 it was moved by two comrades on behalf of the communist party of india that is comrade maulana hasrat mohani and comi comrade swami kumarananda a maulana and a swami moved this resolution on behalf of the cpi which was then not accepted by gandhi mahatma gandhi this was only finally accepted by gandhi ji and the national movement in 1929 at the lahore session where purna swaraj slogan was first given but the communists were the ones who advanced the slogan for the first time in indian history and it was the first political party to talk of complete independence from 20 to 34 it was a period of consolidation of the indian governors facing most severe repression and from 34 onwards in a unified manner centralized manner the communist party could work but this interventions that were taking place in the national movement in the struggle for freedom are important today to recollect because of the battles we have in today's context it's not merely for historical record but the contributions of communists have been long lasting in the sense that they continue to be relevant in today's battles that we are facing today to save india and our constitution today in today's condition during the 20s and 30s a very big ideological struggle was going on between three visions that emerged during the freedom struggle during the decade of the 20s communist party was formed in 1920 unity conference in 1925 the rss was founded in 1925 the congress party that was in existence for a long time nevertheless articulated for the first time its vision of what should constitute independent india that came with the motilal nehru commission report that was made public in 1928 and that spoke in terms of a future of our country given all our diversities an immense richness in our uh, diversity which is not related to any one aspect there are multiplicity of languages multiplicity of religions multiplicity of traditions multiplicity of ethnic origins with all this uh, rich diversity the only political structure that can be established post independence was a secular democratic republic that can unify our people and you are in the, you are unify and maintain the integrity of our country the communists on the other hand said yes the political structure has to be a secular democratic republic but political independence that we achieve will have to be converted into the economic independence and social independence of every single citizen of india and that socio economic independence of every citizen will have to be only possible under socialism and therefore even after independence the movement towards socialism must continue and the communists won 
and that warning is vindicated by today's developments. The communists warned then that if this progress towards socialism is not undertaken, then this very secular democratic republic that we shall found, that itself will become unsustainable. And that unfortunately is the truth today. And on many issues, Baba Sahib Ambedkar and the communists may, had, may have had different uh, approaches, but there are many issues in which there was a convergence of our thought. And on this particular issue, Baba Sahib Ambedkar was most eloquent when he presented the draft constitution for approval to the Constituent Assembly in 1949, which we observe as the day of the constitution today. On that day, when presenting the draft, he gave a warning. He said, what we have created is the political structure, whereby those days it was a revolutionary act of giving universal suffrage, of saying everybody in India, the rich and the poor, the Dalit and the Brahmin, the Adivasi and the uh, city dweller, woman and man, everybody will have one vote and each vote will have one value. He said, one person, one vote, one vote, one value. But then, Baba Sahib Ambedkar lamented that we do have not yet created one person, one value. Until we are able to create that overcoming our very, very deep socio-economic contradictions, this very political structure that we have built up so laboriously will be thrown asunder. These are his words. So the movement towards socialism was an important element, which unfortunately was aborted by the ruling classes of independent India when they pursued the capitalist path of development. And this process itself would create the unsustainability of the secular democratic republic. And that is exactly what these communal forces have been exploiting. Because as opposed to these two visions was the third vision, which argued that the character of independent India will be determined by the religious affiliation of its people. As the president of the Hindu Mahasabha, in a presidential address, Savarkar says that there are two nations in India, a Hindu nation and an Islamic nation. And this is what Jinnah picks up and says, I agree, there are two nations in India, and therefore an Islamic Republic is what we demand, that is the Muslim League, and they went ahead with it. It was, in fact, Savarkar who coined the term Hindutva. He is the one who articulated and theorized on the term Hindutva. And on the basis of this, this two-nation theory was born. And as a result of that, the unfortunate partition of India, the consequences of which we are still paying today, the consequent tensions and the communal strife, which we are still paying the price for it today. And it was the battle between these three visions that actually define the course of the freedom struggle and which actually can today influences the political battles that are taking place in the country today. So therefore, these are not contributions that the communists made as a historical past. These are contributions of long lasting value, which had an impact on politics all through and continue to have even today. Because it is in this background that you must see with this understanding of an inclusive India. Political freedom, yes, but extend to socio-economic freedom. It is with this that the communists launched all their major struggles. Before that, the communists were the first ones to be clear on what is secularism and what is democracy. And they argued that in Indian conditions, which is correct, which is vindicated even today, in Indian conditions, secularism and democracy are not two separate compartments. You cannot have secularism without democracy. You cannot have democracy without practicing secularism. So it is therefore the term that emerged was secular democracy. And this concept of secular democracy politically articulated for the first time by the communists was clearly expressed by I mean, Roy in his writings in 1920s and 21, 22, 23, when there were big communal rights taking place in the country. We are all aware 1919 was the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, 
after the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, the British relearned again that if the Hindus, the Muslims, the Sikhs, the Brahmins, the Rajputs and the Dalits, if they are all united in the struggle for independence, then the British cannot survive. They perfected the art of the art of divide and rule and the policies that followed. They were ably aided and abetted by the communal and the fundamentalist forces then. And they continued to be all through. And because of that, communal strife took place all over the country. In order to contain that, the appeal was made by the communists. This was before the Kanpur Unity Conference. An appeal was made by the communists to the Indian people, appealing to all the exploiters to realize that you may be a Hindu worker, a Muslim worker, a Sikh worker, a Christian worker, but you are nevertheless exploited in the same manner. You could be an agricultural labor, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh or Christian or, or, or from any other caste, but you are exploited in the same manner. The exploiters are united. The exploiters divide people in the name of emotive issues and mainly on the name of religion now. So the unity of the toilers, that is the fundamental antidote to communalism. And therefore, while actively working for peace committees in all the communal town areas, along with the national movement, the communists also articulated a scientific understanding of secularism, which is continues to be valid till date, which in fact found expression in our constitution. But unfortunately, in practice, it was not adhered to. And what was that? Secularism means the complete separation of religion from politics, from administration, from government. The task of independent India's constitution and the government shall be to protect the right of every individual's choice in his or her faith. Protect the people's choice to religion, but the state and the government has no religion. That was the separation that the communists articulated, but unfortunately found expression in the constitution. But unfortunately, over the years, secularism was treated as equality of all religions. And the movement, you say equality of all religions, the religious affiliation of the majority of the population has a natural advantage. And that is what we are seeing today. So that is, that is why this concept of secular democracy for the first time that was articulated, what the communists said then in the initial years is something that continues to remain valid even today. And that is why when we talk of the contributions of the communist movement, observe the centenary. We must recognize this reality and truth that what was said then continues to remain valid today. Then the big struggles of Telangana, the armed struggle in Telangana for three years liberated thousands of villages from oppression and exploitation. It gave land to the tiller. The Punapravaila struggle in, in uh, Kerala, the Tebaga struggle in, uh, uh, in Bengal, the Varli tribal struggle in Maharashtra, the Surma Valley, Kesa peasant struggle in Assam. Many other struggles all over. There are many such that happened in Tamil Nadu as well. And many such struggles all over brought to the question for the issue of land and the question of land reforms. If land reforms became an issue in the national movement, if it became an issue that had to be brought in in terms of a legislation to abolish Zamindari, that was the contribution of these big glorious struggles led by the communists. So the question of India's economic self-reliance, of India's food security, of India's security of our farmers, all these are the issues that the communists contributed, which had to become law. It's a different matter that law was never properly implemented, land reforms, naturally, because the landlords were alliance partners of the ruling classes post-independent, along with the bourgeoisie led by the big bourgeoisie. But nevertheless, it remained in law, remains still in law, which can be utilized and which has been utilized by the left wing governments and by Sheikh Abdullah, using the powers of Article 370, which has now been abolished. That uh, 370, he implemented land reforms completely in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. 
So therefore, what we see today is on the question of economic self-reliance, the contributions made by the Communist Party and the big working class struggles. The formation of the trade union, the same year as the Communist Party was founded in 1920. And the working class coming together in the right of the Indian working people, not only against their exploitation, their trade union rights, but also in the defense of Indian economy and its sovereignty and its self-reliance. So if self-reliance is become a slogan, this is one of the foundational pillars of our constitution. Secular democracy is one pillar, self-reliance, economic self-reliance is the other. On the third level, the big struggles launched by the communists, communists all over the country against social evils like caste oppression. You have a big history in Tamil Nadu in this fight against caste oppression that the communists led. Kill well, well winning. I mean, that would have been, whatever be the timing in the year, that's a different matter. But the issue of social oppression, the issue of fighting against social oppression, that brought to the fore the, the entire issue of social justice. The temple entry movement in Kerala, led by A.K. Gopalan, E.M.S. Ambedipad, etc., big communist stalwarts, the social reform movement in Bengal. So all these things brought to the agenda and the fore another foundational pillar of our constitution, that is social justice. And importantly, again, in the fourth arena, even after independence, the question of linguistic equality for all languages was something that evaded, that continues to evade even today. The efforts to impose their language, one language in the whole country, saying it's one nation, one language, one culture. These efforts are continuing to him. But it was the communists who led the struggles for linguistic reorganization. Vishalandra, the slogan that was advanced by P. Sundaraya, that was the first salvo. It was followed by IK Kerala, a movement for the unification of all Malayali speaking areas both princely and the British rule. That was led by, again, communist stalwarts in Kerala. Then the Sanyukta Maharashtra, led amongst others by Dange, Comrade Dange, etc. These struggles for linguistic organization, it took nearly a decade after independence. 1956, finally, the linguistic reorganization of the states happened. It began in the sense, it continues. It is even today, there are many uh, leftover vestiges that need to be settled. But nevertheless, the question that arose was that of linguistic states and their governments. The question of state governments came up and that brought to the fore agenda, the fourth foundational pillar of our constitution, that is federalism. Federalism, that it became important in the sense that in our constitution, article number one, what does it say? A single line article. India, that is Bharat, is a union of states. So the states, without states, there's no India. The relations between the center and the states, the principles of federalism, in their establishment, the communist struggles played a very big role. So the four fundamental pillars that we have today, these four fundamental pillars were the contributions of the big struggles that were laid, led by the communists, whether it's a question of secular democracy, the question of social justice, the question of economic self-reliance, and the question of federalism. These four constituted the fundamental pillars of our society, and this, this today also are, this today are under assault, all four of them. Because when, after independence, when India rejected the theocratic, fascistic Hindu Rashtra of the RSS variety, while well, Islamic Republic of Pakistan was born, that anger and frustration by those, the rabid communal forces, was the, was the, result, uh, the result of which was Mahatma Gandhi's assassination. 
So this battle continued all along. And what we are seeing today is that this battle has reached a level where it claims legitimacy from the people with 37% of the vote due to our system of parliamentary democracy, a numerical strength, and they are exercising the tyranny of majority in the parliament in order to, in order to ensure that, that they complete this project of transforming India into their rapidly intolerant, authoritarian, totalitarian, fascistic Hindutva Rashtra. What are we seeing today? Every single one of these fundamental pillars is being challenged. Secular democracy? To all of us, we've seen what is secular about secularism. What is being uh, uh, what is being created today is a new political narrative, and that narrative is that on fifteenth August, nineteen forty-seven, India and Indian people achieved their independence. But on fifth August, two thousand nineteen and two thousand twenty, India achieved its real freedom. In 2019, the only Muslim majority state in India, JNK, was dissolved, converted into two union territories overnight. The attacks on the Muslim minorities, victims of communal violence being charged, arrested, and detained and jailed, while the perpetrators of communal violence go scot free. Communal profiling. All these things are happening today in order to create the divide between Hindus and Muslims. The sharper, deeper the divide, the greater the political benefits for the RSS and the BJP. That, so this entire history is obliterated. There are no languages other than Hindi and Sanskrit. One nation, one language. And therefore that whole thing is being imposed on South India. And therefore, in this sense, one nation, one culture, one language, one uh, religion, and therefore, now Mr. Modi is extending it to one election, one leader, and all others are international. So therefore, what we are seeing today is the entire negation of secularism, economic self-reliance, Prime Minister Modi gives the slogan as though it's his new creation. Self-reliance was a slogan that dates back to Dada Bhai Nauruji in the national movement. To the 19th century. But yet, in the name of self-reliance, what are, what are the policies being pursued? Policies of self-subservience. Loot of national resources. Agri laws that destroy Indian agriculture, place them at the disposal of the big <coughs> multinational agribusiness and destroy the Indian farmer, push them into greater indebtedness and at the same time vicious attacks on the rights of the working class, abolition of the labor laws and all this is being accompanied with the slogan of economic self-reliance. It is not economic self-reliance, economic self-subservience. Atrocities on Dalits, the crimes against women, the atrocity against our uh, tribals, whose traditional forest habitat is being removed because mining and, and uh, I mean, our natural resources, mineral resources are being privatized. So the social justice is sort of moving towards that, what we have today is a social order under the Manusmriti, which legalizes, justifies caste oppression and caste repression. That is being put in place. So in terms of secular democracy, economic self-reliance, social justice, and then come to the fourth pillar of federalism, all the rights of the states are trampled upon. Agri bills that were brought, agriculture is a state subject, but no state government was consulted. New education policy they are bringing. Education is a concurrent subject, but state governments were not taken on board. In today's global context, if you see, it has been proven once again that the neoliberal global capitalist order 
does not have a solution to this economic crisis. The economic crisis is very, very intense, and the World Bank yesterday is on record saying that this is the worst economic disaster that has happened to the world after the Great Depression. Neoliberalism means essentially what? Maximizing profits. Maximizing profits means intensifying exploitation. Intensification of exploitation means misery, hunger, unemployment, growth. But at the same time, people's purchasing power in their hands keep reducing drastically. When people don't have money to buy, money to survive first, even then if they survive, they don't have money to buy. Capitalism can never survive because what is produced is not sold. Then neither profits are made nor economy can grow. So you have a situation today whereby you are reducing this entire capitalist crisis into a situation where there's no solution under capitalism and the only solution can come from outside of capitalism and that can only be the political alternative of socialism which can be can be achieved only through the, under the leadership of the communist party adhering to marxism leninism that's why communists today when we talk of our when we talk of our centenary we talk of our glorious struggles we must also recognize that it's not only these struggles, not only these historical junctures, not only these important movements, not only the entire effort made by the communists for the realization of an inclusive India, which is nowadays being, being called the idea of India, for the struggles in independent India that led to the formation of left front governments in Bengal, in Kerala, in Tripura, and these governments showing the path of an alternative direction to the Indian people. All these have been achievements, but the fundamental contribution that the communists made for the evolution of modern India, the four foundational pillars that I, be, I was talking about, today all of them are under assault. And unless those who are assaulting them are separated from class rule, are separated from holding the reins of state power, are separated from destroying our institutions, they are destroying these institutions because these institutions are checks and balances. They need to be destroyed if you want to destroy the constitution and establish their Hindutva rush. Beginning with the parliament. You see now last parliament session, question answer session abolished. Government will absolve itself from being accountable to the parliament. Then look at the judiciary. For over a year, our challenges to the Abolition of Article 370, Kashmir, etc., they remain pending before the Supreme Court. For many, many months, the challenges to the Citizenship Amendment Act as being ultra virus of the Indian Constitution, as being actually unconstitutional, these have not been heard. So that is why the need of the R is actually now to strengthen our independent strength, CPIM. Secondly, to strengthen left unity. Thirdly, to forge the broadest possible fronts in the defense of people's issues, people's interests, and in the defense of India's unity and integrity. That is the challenge before all of us. And that is the challenge that we'll have to rise to the occasion. So observation of the centenary is not merely for the sake of record, for the sake of noting down historical details. Observation means a redoubling of our resolve, rededicating our resolve that this unfinished task of transforming our political independence into the economic independence of our socio-economic independence of people, that has to be completed. In a world where, again, this political alternative is being talked about and it's emerging, in that context, in India, we have a very important role to play. And the communist, uh, communist movement today has an important role to play in shaping the struggle to defend Indian constitution so that we can change it for the better. So that is why this centenary must lead us to a rededication of our commitment. And in 
we need to strengthen this further to save India today, therefore we can change it for the better. That is the real meaning of observing our centenary. So these are some of the issues I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Once again, red salute to all of you. All of you. Yes.